Okay, so uh, I can finish it now? Yeah, no, it's good. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to Kirka's Lunch and Learn. This is the last one in the semester series. And uh, I'm uh, Dr. Lamise Jarvanen. I'm the Kirka director, if you don't know me yet. Um, and one of the things that we try to do with the Lunch and Learns is provide professional development and skill development for students. And uh, we always appreciate it when faculty and staff are able to come and share their expertise. So today we have Professor uh, Rico Acevedo and Professor Amanda Salasinski, who are going to be leading our designing our poster. They've done this before and they did such a fantastic job. So I really appreciate both of them being here to share their expertise with us. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out to me. And we also have Tom Howard, who is our Kirka grad assistant, who's also always happy to field questions, especially you no know, technical ones too. So, um, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I can maybe have you just live and Shane, are you also from Movement Science? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, welcome. I'm going to let you guys take it away then because I know that you're limited on time. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Professor Acevedo um, and uh, my partner in crime today is Professor Amanda Salasinski. Uh, I am from Chemistry and she is from Movement Science. Um, together, we probably have done, oh, I would say, thousands of poster presentations uh, in our time as uh, scientists. And so uh, today we are gonna help you uh, designing your poster. And so we're, we're gonna go over uh, just a couple of things uh, to help you out. Um, uh, the first uh, thing that, we're that we have to acknowledge is the fact that uh, really posters are an intersection between uh, Bob Ross artistics and uh, scientific knowledge. And so it turns out that uh, the poster is a graphical representation of your research. And so we're gonna describe uh, how to best format and design an academic poster. And uh, we're also gonna talk to you at the end about how to convert these posters into audio and video formats, uh, given the fact that we are currently in a virtual world. Um, and so uh, Professor Salasitsky is going to uh, chime in when she can um, and, and help us uh, and help us or at least help me uh, try to finish this uh, presentation. Um, so the objectives of posters are uh, basically they're just like advertisements. And so if you look uh, over here at this image, right, um, this advertisement is about recycling plastic. All right. And so it, it is meant to be kind of like eye candy so that it catches your attention and draws you into the words, right? So if you notice the graphic itself is the selling point. And then if you stare at the, at the graphic long enough, you actually read the words, right? And so um, academic posters are the same. They're meant to be a visual storyboard. Um, today, we're gonna go over these uh, two big topics, which are how to conceptualize your poster and, um, and then how to use that poster uh, to, to practice. All right, and so we're gonna go over the three uh, conceptual topics, which are audience, guidelines, and material. Okay, so the first question is who is gonna be listening? Uh, who is going to be the audience for your poster? All right, and so you have different audience members. You can have uh, faculty or friends, family. Um, you could be giving a poster session to a potential employer, uh, or you could be using your poster at a grad school presentation. Um, it turns out that based on the audience member, we have to consider different things about our posters. So the, the biggest thing that decides what gets placed on our poster and what emphasis we draw from it is basically what is the knowledge base of our audience. So today we're gonna to consider two of them. Uh, the first one is a general or mixed audience. And this is best represented by like the COCA celebration or Mass ERC, uh, other local conferences. Um, 
that, that invite general audience participation. And so this is the broadest um, in terms of knowledge. So you'll, be, you'll have to explain things in very basic way um, and you'll have to appeal to a different variety of, uh, of people. Um, and then you have national conferences. These are big, highly specialized. Uh, these would be considered an expert audience. And so in this case, um, you can kind of do away with like the, the broad topic settings and you get to talk about things in very technical, highly detailed forms. Um, and sometimes, so, at these, sometimes at these national conferences, um, people who you have cited will be asking you questions about your research, okay? So, so yes, you're gonna be talking to ex experts. Yeah, it, it, it has happened uh, more often than not that the, pers the topic that I'm talking about is, uh, and that I, the person that I'm talking to is actually the person who wrote the primary literature on this topic. Like, oh yeah, I studied nucleic acids in the 60s. And I'm like, oh, your citation reference number one, three, five, and seven. So um, it, it, it is amazing who comes to these conferences, at least the big national ones. Um, sometimes you get lucky and they'll actually come to regional conferences. And so um, preparing for your, for your presentation uh, can kind of pay off in this manner. Um, okay, so let's talk first about uh, our professional audience. And so I'm going to have Amanda talk about this. All right, so um, Dr. Acevedo and I worked on a project together and this um, poster was done for the New England American College of Sports Medicine Conference. So it was very professional based audience. Um, and we um, decided that we had our abstract here on the poster, we have our title nice and big. We have pictures because we wanted to show what they were doing and we have lots of graphs. It's a little bit, um, it's written in more technical terms than the next example that we're gonna show you. But um, I used pink for the pink breast cancer color. We have the Westfield symbol on there. Um, and if you look, the abstract is very important and the tables are very important. So when you look at the poster, it sort of, sort of looks like a diamond shape, right? We have the, the title up on the top, then the abstract information, and then it kind of comes back down into a V on the bottom where the most important results are in graph and figure form. Okay. okay. So, so this was for a professional audience. Now I'm going to show you the one that I made for our Kirka celebration last year. And so this is the same, this is the same data presented in a vastly different format. For instance, you can see I've I've elected to use the standard column format. All right. Also, there's a lot less technical words, right? And if if you go around and read it, you will notice that things are set in a very broad general base palette. The other thing is, is that I centered my results, what I thought was important, right in the middle. All right, so my results are in the middle, my data is in the middle, and then things that are less important are on the outside, all right? The other thing that you notice is that there's less pictures, but they're bigger, all right? And that's because it, it helps to declutter um, our, uh, our poster. Um, because it because this is a general based audience, I can get away with presenting less about the technical data and more about the generalized results. And we also put information for the community since the community is also welcome at the Kirka celebration, faculty, staff, students that are um, were affected by breast cancer. So we had the dates of the next program that was going to be starting for um, the water aerobics. Yeah, so we put it right here in this little box in figure three. Um, so uh, now that you know about the audiences that you're gonna be encountering, let's talk a little bit about the poster guidelines. All right, and so um, one thing that you have to know is that 
even though we want to put everything that we've ever done onto the poster, it might be more beneficial to use less. Um, and so I'm going to show you how to go from an abstract to a poster in three basic steps. All right, so here we have uh, our design, our, our abstract. If you recall, if you're uh, applying to go to Kirka or you apply to present a poster, uh, you'll be asked to provide an abstract. And an abstract is about 250 words in length, depending on where you go. It could be more, it could be less. Um, so you'll, you'll usually you will have uh, a title in your abstract, and then you will have the uh, author list underneath of your uh, title, and then you're going to have your abstract. All right, and so these are the basic three steps that you do. The first step is that you put your title here at the top. All right, uh, you put it in big letters because you want people to see it. Um, and you only want to place the words in the title that are essential for the title to be understood. All right, um, the other thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to make it all caps lock. <laughs> Um, in the second spot is our author list, all right? And so people that helped you with the poster, uh, your mentor, uh, your lab mates uh, go onto this list. Um, if you collaborated across different disciplines or across different uh, uh, labs, usually each author will get an address. Uh, for the most part, for, uh, for us at Westfield, Usually it's just Westfield State, Westfield, Massachusetts. Um, and then what happens to your abstract is it gets broken down into different uh, topics that go across the bottom. All right, so uh, part of your abstract contains a small introduction that will go into the introduction box. If you have an aim or a hypothesis, that goes into the aims or hypothesis box. Uh, most of the time in your abstract, you talk a little bit about the methods, and then you can extrapolate that and put the important methods into a methods box. Um, likewise, you see that the results here are stuck uh, squarely in the middle, um, and that the conclusions are on the side. Uh, something that you always want to do is you always want to have acknowledgments uh, and, uh, and your citations. Um, and so these usually go into one of the bottom corners. Um, if you notice, there are a lot of figures. Here they are presented in just generic square boxes. Um, but it turns out that because a poster is a graphical display, the figures are really the stars of the show. And so um, here is uh, a figure that uh, Amanda and I made. Um, and I'm going to show you the three components of this figure, all right? Component number one is our title, all right? And our title does one of two things. Um, it either summarizes a major result or it states the type of analysis that you're going to find in your figure, all right? So in this case, it says average changes in body water over a 12-week period. So hopefully, my figure is about body water and about uh, a period of time that is 12 weeks, right? And so, so far, my figure checks out. <laughs> um, and my students, I know Liv, Shane, Carly, you had to do the labs and we always, I always take off for titles and if your axes are not labeled with the units. So they're, they're, very, they're very familiar with this. Right, your, your figure body should be readable. And so you should make sure that you when you ever you make a figure that you print it out so that you see what it looks like on paper. Um, it turns out that graphical displays are great at fooling us into thinking that everything is readable. Um, but once you print it out, you know for sure. Um, as, as Professor Salasinski mentioned, units are important. Our axes have to be labeled. Otherwise, we might understand what's happening in the graph but your audience won't because they won't know what the, what the axes are. Um, the last part is the figure legend. And so the figure legend is probably the most complicated one because we tend to either put nothing in there or we put everything. Uh, and so we need to find a happy median for that. Um, and so usually it's just one or two sentences 
and it describes the method that was required to make this figure, um, or it describes the key finding, which is your major result. So if you look at this graph, it looks like none of the lines are changing over the 12 week period, right? The, line, the lines are flat. And so hopefully this thing says that moderate water aerobics does not have an impact in body water, which is our major finding. Um, and so um, this is an example of how to make a good figure. And so each figure should be able to tell its own story. Um, and this helps your reader because it, it, it eliminates confusion. Um, however, if your reader is, is still puzzled, then that's where you stand next to your, your poster so that you can help them understand it. Um, so now we talked about our major components, which are our title, uh, our body, and of course the star of the figure. So let's talk about poster design, All right? So there's many ways to design a poster. There's different types of column format and we'll go over those. Uh, usually they go from top to bottom or for less to, from left to right. Um, and this is more tradition than uh, hard, uh, than a uh, hard fact. Uh, most of your boxes, your columns will have a section heading. Uh, you want to devote the space to graphics, all right? Because this is a graphical representation, There, it shouldn't be like the poster that you see here where it is all words, right? Because then, then it, 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 it's too much for a person to look at and be interested in it. Think about the fact that we're really trying to replicate this into, a, into an advertisement, right? Um, if you're gonna put words, they should be short phrases. Um, you can put them in bullet lists or you can put them in complete sentences. Um, many people stick to uh, different types of fonts. Uh, if you, if you work at a newspaper, um, people, uh, you, you, will no, you will notice that all the fonts are the same uh, and that they only use specific ones. Um, from, from doing lots of these posters, I can tell you that Arial, Havatica, Verdana, or Georgia font seem to be the ones that cause the least amount of clash. Um, the other thing is you wanna leave a lot of white space. And so a lot of times we think of white space as wasted space. Um, however, um, in terms of helping people organize their thoughts, leaving white space can be very beneficial. And so we'll go over why that is. Uh, the last thing is that you always wanna use a light background and you wanna use dark letters. So the poster here breaks all of those rules. The first thing is it's a black background and it has white letters. So the letters look really small, even though they're in the typeset that they should be in. Uh, the other thing that you notice is that this abstract doesn't go from left to right. It actually goes around. So it goes abstract, introduction, materials at the top, results, conclusions, acknowledgments. And so the, the way that you read it is very, is very awkward. Um, and so we'll go over a couple more posters, uh, specifically two more examples of what not to do as a poster, and we'll have you look at why. All right, so here's our first poster. And so my question to you is, what do you see in this poster? So I'll give you guys a second, and then you can uh, unmute yourself and blurt out exactly what you see in this poster. So when you look at it, what's the first thing that you see? The horse as the background. Was it my little pony? Yeah. <laughs> so, so do you know what this poster is about right off the bat? No. Right? The only thing that you see is this pony, all right? I'm not saying that the pony image is bad, but if, you're, if your objective is to show off your research, you have missed the point with this poster, right? I can see you guys kind of like peering <laughs> into, the, into the box to try to figure out what this poster is about. Um, the thing is, is that the rest, of, the rest of this poster is actually really good. So if you can look past the pony, you will see that all her results and stuff 
are inside of the middle of, the, of that four column box, which is good. You see that there's headings. You can uh, clearly see that it goes, it goes from top to bottom and from left to right. However, her choice of background really hinders this poster. Um, let's look at another one. So here's another poster. Tell me what you see in this poster. I see EMG. I see a lot of figures. Yep. A lot of pictures. Yeah. And so the, the fact is, is that in this poster, it it is a classic manifestation of someone who really loves their research and so puts everything in into the poster. Right? So it's hard to kind of get at what this poster's true objective is because it shows everything. And while the images themselves are, are, are really well done, so if you actually pay attention, every figure has a figure legend and every figure legend explains what the figure individual figure is about, there's just so many of them that it's hard to focus. The other thing that you, that you will notice is that the conclusion is kind of uh, stuck into the bottom corner. And if you were to stand next to this poster, you would actually be looking down to try to find the conclusion, all right? And so because there's just so many images and so many different types of images, this can be cluttered, all right? Last one. What do you see in this image? Or what do you see in this poster? I, I really like this poster. I think it's very artistic and it's clear you're talking about. Yep. And the colors are used so wonderfully, like the pie charts. I, I can't even read them because of because we're in Zoom, but it's, I mean, it's easy to read, I think. All right. The fact is, is that this poster was done by a graphic artist from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. This graphic artist will tell you that they know nothing about the Egyptian goose or the mute swan. However, they do know about graphic design. This poster breaks a lot of the rules that we just talked about, all right? It uses lots of colors. There are two ways, there are two modes of reading this poster, right? So in, in the left-hand side, it goes from top to bottom. And on the right-hand side, it goes from left to right. However, because of the design, it does not detract from the poster. And so just, just so that you know, just like in science, rules can be broken, <laughs> all right? But you have to know how to do it. So, uh, so unless you're feeling very adventurous at your national conference, usually it's helpful to follow some formats. And so I'm gonna show you some of these formats right now, All right? So there's lots of poster formats. You can quickly put in a Google search that says academic poster formats, and you will get thousands of hits for different formats, all right? Can I just, can I interrupt yes. and just say that mm -hmm. a lot of these like, resources that you're sharing, um, I also think they're fantastic resources and we have a link to them on our Krika website for students. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm so, gonna have to leave, but I'm gonna jump in for one more thing. Um, just make sure that your, whatever font you decide to use, that it's the same. So if you're having your boxes and you have the introduction, um, methods, results, whatever font you use, make sure that each of the boxes are labeled with the same font, and then you use the same font and same size within each box. Okay. And sorry, everyone, that I, I will have to go. Thank you so much, Professor Sal. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Sal. Hi, guys. So, um, 
So things that you want to make sure, make sure that your poster dimensions are okay. You don't want to make a poster that is way too small for uh, the poster session. Uh, you also don't want to make a poster that is going to drag on the floor when you try to hang it up. Um, so you can check uh, on those. Uh, usually the poster session will tell you. Um, the best part about using these posters is that you can use the copy paste strategy, right? Where you just copy it from, uh, copy things from your abstract and you just paste them into the appropriate boxes. Um, the fact is a lot of these posters follow our visual basic guidelines, which means they have a logical flow. They go from left to right, from top to bottom. The spaces of the boxes are meant to target the importance they are. So if you notice the introduction is small, material methods is small, uh, literature cited is small, your acknowledgments is small, things like things that you want to show off are really small. And the big picture items are results, figures, conclusion. Right, and so you'll notice that there's a reason why these are the biggest picture, the biggest boxes. That's because that's where you're supposed to be putting all of your focus. Um, and so here are the basic structures. So in terms of format, you have your classic four column format. All right, notice that your results and your figures are the center, right? Because that's what you want people to focus on. Your conclusions are at the top so that people can compare them with your results, all right? Um, your intro is to the side, your method is small and to the side, your acknowledgments are at the bottom. Um, and so this is the classic one that most, the ones that uh, most people use to present. The second one is the large center box. All right, so this is a three column format. Again, the results section is star right in the center. Your conclusions are high and to the right. All right, the last one, and this one's, uh, this one is uh, not as popular, but still used. And that's, this is the portrait format. And so in the portrait format, you can see that it, it is a lot more narrow, uh, but your results are still in the middle. Your conclusions are still somewhere around eye level and your acknowledgements are at the bottom. The intro and the methods get skirted to the top. And so most people are gonna look straight into your results section. Okay, um, the rest of this talk is really devoted to figuring out how to do video and voice recordings. It turns out that everything is online. Heck, we're talking online right now. Um, and so so is the poster. Uh, so is the, the Kirka presentation. And so we are able to take advantage of the fact that everything is online by making video recordings of our posters. So instead of standing next to it and awkwardly uh, sitting in silence until we can manage to corral someone to listen to our presentation that we worked really hard on, uh, now you can make a video recording of it. And so uh, the benefits of recording are many. The first one is that once you make this recording, you are done, right? So you don't have to say it 300 times. Um, and so you can feel like any music artist and be one and done. Um, the other thing is that this, this uh, format is really easy to share. So once you upload this onto uh, a streaming platform like YouTube, um, you can just share the link. You can share it with your friends. You can share it with your family. Other people that you might want to consider sharing this with are recruiters, employers, your graduate and med programs because these are the people that you want to show off to, right? And so if you're interested in getting a job and uh, in, uh, I don't know, biopharmaceuticals uh, and you are doing research about um, medicinal practices, this would be something that your employer might want to look at. Um, and so I'm gonna show you um, how to do this. And so, the first part is gonna be the same as any, any time that you decide that you're gonna present information. So you're gonna, so you have two choices. You can write it down or you can design it. Here I've written down what I wanna talk about. Notice that this is in complete sentences, in paragraphs. Um, I've, I've scratched out things that 
I ended up not wanting. I've highlighted things that I think are more important. The fact is, is that I want to tell a story. And so in order to tell a story, you have to write it. Uh, the second part, um, if you are more of a visual learner, it might be helpful to design a poster first before you start talk, thinking about what you're going to talk about. The third point is actually one of the most important ones. And this is to say the stuff out loud. The words that I have written down sound really well in the written down format. But once you get to talking, those words are going to change, right? Our written language is very different than our spoken language. And so you want to be able to say it out loud, hear yourself saying it. And this will give you two things. Number one, it will let you know when you're talking very, when you're talking about something that you're not supposed to be talking about, which I do a lot. And number two, it gives you a, a gist of how much time you spent on things. Um, and so once you do that once, you'll find out that you'll probably need to go back to step one and two and redo it and then do step three again. And so you end up in this like four step cycle. All right, the second thing that you have to do is find no cost to you recording software, all right? Um, we currently are using Zoom. Zoom is great for recording voice and audio. I'm gonna show you how. Um, you can also use PowerPoint. Uh, there's actually a link in the Kirka website um, uh, that has a PowerPoint presentation of me showing you how to do a PowerPoint presentation, which is very fourth wall broken. Um, but there's a link to that in our uh, in the website, and so I'll show you that link at the end. Okay. Can I also mm -hmm. just say along the lines of those? There's also another video that Tom uh, that I had Tom make, and that uses uh, Screencast-O-Matic as well. So there are definitely a lot of options. We do find that PowerPoint's a little bit difficult to integrate into our uh, website. So just FYI, yeah. as long as you can get it to MP4, we're good. But if you can't, then it's difficult. Yep. Um, and so, uh, so I'm going to show you how to do this using Zoom. All right. And so the first thing that you want to do is you want to start a private meeting. Um, and uh, if you don't know how to do this, all you have to do is Google it. Uh, but uh, basically, you open up a meeting that only you have access to, and that way you don't get people Zoom bombing you, because that would be awkward. Um, the second part is that, is that you share your screen. And so in the middle of your screen, you just see a big green share button. You click on it, and it will bring up this, uh, this window right here. All right? Um, if you're just do, using this for audio, this also works for audio mode. So the way that I'm showing you is to do video, but you'll see at the end that you can just take the audio if the audio is all you want. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to click on this selection that says optimize screen sharing for video clip. Uh, this will minimize your camera on your Zoom cast. And this is great because you no longer stare at yourself giving your own presentation. And it, it feels very big brother to me. Uh, so, so I tend to minimize myself so that I'm not spending time looking at how awkward I'm talking. Um, okay, the next thing you want to do is you want to share the screen that you're looking at. Uh, right now I have highlighted screen one. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on this one that uh, brings me to a website that shows me uh, this plasmid. All right, you don't, have any, you don't have to know anything about. Okay, so once you get to this point, all right, uh, you will see this bar at the bottom and there'll be a little spot that, that has three dots and says more. You click on it and it will bring this pop up and then you hit record on this computer. All right. Once you click on that, you will be recording. All right. Uh, some things to caution you about is that usually you don't see the mouse in your Zoom cast. Uh, and if you want to, you actually have to go over here and click on annotate that has a little pencil. Uh, and then it will bring the pop-up that's over here at the top of the screen that starts with draw. Right next to it is one that says select. And you want to click on that select, it will have a little mouse button. 
I accidentally cut it off of this image, so I apologize. Um, and so once, once the thing starts recording, then you can start talking. Um, I'm going to tell you that the first, oh, I'm going to say five to 10 times, there is probably going to turn out. Um, but once you're done talking, then you just go simply, you click on more again. And then instead of saying record on this computer, it will say stop recording. All right. So then you stop. So that will stop your recording. All right. It's going to take a couple of tries in order to do that naturally so that you're not like staring awkwardly at the screen and trying to find out where this more button is. So I, I suggest that you just practice doing that first, turning the recording on and turning the recording off uh, just so that it can help you. Well, I'm speaking from experience. So this is very awkward for me. Um, OK, so um, now you're almost done in terms of once you stop recording, it. It, you you are done in terms of the presentation. So if you don't like how it went, then you just close Zoom. Uh, Zoom will instantly start converting your recording into three different formats, uh, M4A format, which is just the audio, uh, M3U format, which is specifically for Zoom, and then this MP4 format, which is your audio and visual, all right? Um, if you don't like it, then you just open Zoom back up and try again. Uh, however, if you like it, then you get to choose one. So if you're just in it for the audio and you just want to show your presentation and then talk through your presentation, um, then you just choose the audio, which is a, a M4A format. And this just, ha this just has your voice. Um, However, if you're recording this for the purpose of showing it as a Zoom clip, uh, then, you, uh, then you will take the Zoom underscore zero dot MP4. I suggest you rename it. You rename the file so that, because you're going to end up having like, I'm going to say like several, several of these. It probably took me 20 tries to do my first one. Um, and, so, and so you just name it with something that you can find on your computer. Um, after that, I suggest that you download this onto something like YouTube. Because um, that way you can you can make a unlisted account uh, so that no one else can see it. And you can freely share it using uh, YouTube. Um, and basically, that is a rundown of how to use Zoom in order to make Zoom videos. Um, there's lots more to talk about. Um, and if you have any issues in finishing or starting or the mid part section of your poster, uh, we have a Kirkle website. It has lots of helpful tools that I haven't had the chance to talk about, about poster design. It has links to practical formats. It has links to how to, how to do, um, the audio and videos to your posters, including what types of formats are acceptable. Um, it also has lots of preparation tips and advice. Other places that you can find our advice are faculty members, your mentors, your advisors. Um, we tend to be a very friendly bunch and uh, we can help you, especially if we know that the reason why you wanna do this is because you wanna present a poster and so um, if you need any help, you could always uh, email me or email Dr. Sal. Uh, we'd be happy to help you. Um, yeah, and uh, that's about it in terms of uh, my presentation. And so um, feel free to ask me questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was all really helpful. Um, and and I, I, I think you bring up, well, you bring up a lot of good points, but one of them that I hope is clear is that you know, this is a process and it takes time and there's re, you know, there's iterations. So leave yourself plenty of time to actually think through, put it together, have your faculty mentor look at it, you know, reach out to, to uh, Kirka too, if you need help. Um, but I think your faculty have a better sense of what you're doing and how they think that you should present that work in that field um, so definitely give yourself plenty of, of time and 
use critical feedback. Also too, uh, if you're looking to use Screencast-O-Matic or other uh, video recording softwares to present at Kirka um, later on the semester, um, and if you're having trouble with it, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to answer all your questions. I know that Rico and uh, Dr. Jarvanen said that, um, you know, there's the link on our homepage that has me talking actually um, over the screencast mag tutorial. But um, if you're finding still that you're having issues uh, with the recording software, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And I'll throw my email into the chat in case you want to write it down or take it down. Um, I'm very easily accessible. And um, if you are having issues that um, are also, you know, not just uh, a question um, that you need to show me, you know, through um, Zoom, screen share and whatnot, I'm also available for one-on-one -on -one meetings. You guys have any questions? Okay, so submission starts April 9th through the 20th. Um, and one of the things that I, I wanna point out too is that because we are virtual, there have been a lot of pros, right? As Professor Acevedo indicated, you get to, you get to share this with other people. And so think about that. Think about being professional and showing your best kind of um, foot forward um, and at Kirka, what we've tried to do is provide you with a personalized website that looks professional so that you can easily share it with grad schools, employers, um, friends, family. If, uh, I always, like last semester when we, on the day of the Kirka celebration, we had hundreds, almost a thousand hits and um, of people who came to see the celebration. And it was really cool because we could see where on the map these individuals were from. Uh, so all over the US, we even had some in Europe. And uh, so, yeah, so you never know who's coming, who's looking, um, take advantage of it for sure. I didn't realize that my audio was muted as I was talking. Uh, you. Uh, oh, you, you heard me? Okay, it looked like it looked like it was muted for a second. Okay, never mind. Ignore me. Okay, well, if if you don't have any more uh, questions, thank you so much for coming. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Acevedo. And of course, Salsinski, who's not here. So we'll thank her.